Good evening and welcome to the Bethany Baptist Church Midweek Connection Point. It is February the 24th. Thank you for joining us. Our goal is to keep you connected the best we can to a typical Wednesday night and uh, day in the life of our church family. So thank, f- thank you for tuning in, doing your best to follow along. Before we get to our time in God's Word, I remind you to continue doing your scripture memory. This week is a rest week where you get a chance to review the three verses you've done in Romans so far. I'm very encouraged. Uh, I told you about uh, an entire church that's doing our Romans memory plan with us, but there's also a godly sister all the way in Boston, Massachusetts, who listened to our sermon about scripture memory at the top of the year and uh, notified me through Facebook of not only watching that video, but asked for the reading plan uh, for scripture memory and is doing that with us. So I hope you will too, um, that you'll use this as a reminder to memorize just the one verse you have for this week and continue uh, along with us. Also this Sunday, immediately following church, we'll have a potluck. Uh, Anyone's invited, bring your own uh, dish and we will have uh, spacing, the doors open because of the better weather um, and just do our best to enjoy fellowship the way we can. Uh, And then also next Wednesday night, Uh, During the devotion time of our meeting, which would be a business meeting also Wednesday night, I'm going to do our first round of Q&A about what elders, a plurality of elders, would look like in the life of Bethany Baptist Church. So please, if you have any questions about what elders do, who and uh, why certain men would be qualified and not others, or why women can't be elders, um, or how we even go about appointing them in the coming years at our church, this is your chance to email me or text me a question so that I can address that publicly on a Wednesday night. That would be great so that I can have time to give you an intelligent and thoughtful and winsome response. Um, so in the next week, this is your time to email, text, or even write a question maybe on this Facebook uh, post if you're watching on tonight on Facebook. So next Wednesday night, we'll do Q&A our first round about transitioning to a plurality of elders. I also want to thank and encourage our congregation. This last Sunday in our uh, public gathering, we had 10, 10 first-time guests. Not just guests, but first-time guests. Um, so I'm thankful for uh, those of you who have been showing hospitality to families that have moved into our neighborhoods, and they've invited their family and friends um, I'm thankful for my wife who invited someone that she met at a local gym working out and they brought their family last week. So, uh, I'm just thankful for an outward focused church that is loving, uh, our neighbors and those around us. And also remind you to continue, uh, in your evangelism on Wednesday nights, we have our evangelism encounters where we share where we've been faithful or maybe we've failed to share the gospel, but God gave us opportunities. So I hope you will continue, uh, to do that. I had an opportunity at Dick's Sporting Goods uh, just a couple weeks ago to witness to someone who struck up conversation with me, but I wasn't able to because, not because I didn't evangelize, but because I wasn't being a good parent. My children were running crazy through the store and I had to stop conversation to do that. So uh, that's just a, a something I need to work on and why parenting and loving our children, um, we'd be ready in season and out of season. Uh, and then yesterday I was on Western's campus with the intention of evangelizing and there were two young ladies that are not Christians, and they were sitting there, and I could have talked to them, and I just I just chickened out, and I confessed that sin right away to the next Christian I saw, and I've been praying for more boldness. So I come to you confessing my coldness of heart and lack of concern for those who are perishing. So I hope you will pray for me. I hope you will uh, catch fire and, and grow in your boldness to share the gospel. Um, we, have, we have the only message of eternal life. So I hope you'll be faithful. hope you have better stories you can share or that we'll hear tonight in our church. So if you have a Bible and you want to catch back up with us in 1 Samuel, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 26. 1 Samuel chapter 26, we're following David and his ventures of becoming king and Saul and his continued pursuit and persecution of him. So I'm going to read 1 Samuel chapter 26, uh, all 25 verses. So follow along with me. It reads this way. Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hakalah, which is on the east of Jeshimon? So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, and three thousand chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped on the hill of Hakalah, which is beside the road on the east of Jeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul had came after him into the wilderness, David sent out spies and learned that Saul had indeed come. Then David arose and came to the place where Saul had encamped, and David saw the place where Saul lay with Abner, the son of Ner, 
the commander of his army, Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. Verse 6, Then David said to him, like the Hittite, and to Joab's brother, Abishai the son of Zeruiah, Who will go down with me into the camp of Saul? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai went to the army by night. And there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment with his spear stuck in the ground at his head. And Abner and the army lay around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear and I will not strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into the battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but take now the spear that is at his head in the jar of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jar and the water from Saul's head, and they went away. No man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep. Because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. Verse 13, Then David went over to the other side and stood afar off on the top of the hill with a great space between him. And David called to the army and said to Abner, the son of Ner, Will you not answer, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who are you who calls to the king? And David said to Abner, Are you not a man who is like you in Israel? And why have you not kept watch over your lord the king? For one of the people came in to destroy the king, your Lord. This thing that you have not have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not kept watch over your Lord, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is in the jug of water that was at his head. Verse 17, Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my Lord, O king. And he said, Why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now, therefore, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day, that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now, therefore, let my my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. And David answered and said, Here is the spear, O king. Let one of the young men come over and take it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord. And may he deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. So David went his way, and Saul returned to his place. All right, a lot of verses there. We're going to break it down uh, maybe over the five main characters that are going on here. The the Ziphites, uh, Abishai, Abner, uh, David, and the, and the Lord. Uh, this is a difficult text. Difficult in the sense it's hard to understand what the main point is. Also difficult because it's very similar to chapter 24. If you flip back, it's, it's nearly the exact same setup of where David had a chance to kill Saul and thought about doing it and didn't. Saul said, I freak, uh, I'll stop pursuing you. Uh, you're a good guy. I'm a bad guy. And then two chapters later, the, nearly the exact same scene. So my best guess, the main theme from our text revolves around verse 24, this summary statement and exhortation from David. He says, Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord. And may he deliver me out of all tribulation. The the term there to focus on even more particularly is precious in the sight. Precious life. Precious life. There's a lot of near-death experience here and and murders that are being pursued and murders that could be uh, fulfilled. And so we see the preciousness of life and valuing the life of our enemies uh, in the way that God has shown value of life even to His own enemies in order that He might win them uh, to love Him, to surrender and stop Persecuting. So let's pick up in verses 1 through 5. The Ziphites. The Ziphites egg Saul on to try to kill David, though David does not deserve it. 
The Ziphites are a wicked mob of men who rally 3,000 strong around Saul to go and pursue David and kill him. They do not see that David's life is precious. They are ready to kill him. So the Ziphites are wicked people here. I immediately think of Proverbs chapter 1. It says, My son, do not consent when the mob of fools would say, Let's go cause harm to someone. Saul might have been in a place of repentance and made up his mind, I'm not going to kill David, but these fools that he allows to gather around him strike a match of, uh, upon tinder that just rages in Saul's heart to want to agree to go kill David. These are foolish, foolish friends. They have no good reason to kill David. Saul has admitted already that David is righteous, and yet by being with fools, he is pursuing the righteous unto death. The, Life of David is not precious in their sight. They're going to pursue David like a flea or like a partridge in the mountains to kill him. And, and David realizes this in verse 1 through 5. So just a reminder, too, that as Christians, we might be in the minority most of our life, and we will constantly be pursued uh, for our faith. Even though we might do the right things, we might be persecuted. In fact, we will be persecuted in fact, every chapter in the book of 1 Samuel just reminds again that trials just continue for God's people on this earth uh, for now. So don't be surprised if enemies are pursuing you. You feel like a David and ungodly people are encamping around you and plotting uh, evil for you uh, at work, in school, uh, in, even in the church. These things can happen sadly, but these wicked people are pursuing David unto death. So the Ziphites and, and Saul and their wickedness there. Now verses 6 through uh, 12. I want, I want to focus on Abishai. Now David learns that the Ziphites are encamped just up beyond where he is to try to kill him. And instead of running, he he decides we're going to go into the camp. And we're going we're gonna to make a point. We're going to try to win Saul uh, before he tries to continue killing me or killing us. And so he asked, who will go with me and at night into the camp? And Abishai. Abishai is the one who says, I will go with you. So first off, Abishai looks like a good guy, and you got to commend him. He's courageous. There's just two of them going into a camp against 3,000. So Abishai does have some faith, and Abishai is a noble friend. In fact, in many ways, we should learn from David that we should not go into dangerous uh occasions by ourselves, where temptation to uh, retaliate against our enemies might be strong or a temptation of death. Um, so I like this. It's just like Jesus told his disciples not to go by themselves, but to go two by two. We should take accountability. We should not make any decisions by ourselves. but God gives us the local church, godly elders, godly mighty men and women around us. And so I think that might be why David takes Abishai, why he enlists him in Amalek and Abishai goes. Uh, maybe it's to teach Abishai a lesson. Maybe it's to disciple him. Uh, so this, this starts off in a good thing. Abishai is going to go with him, but as they get into the camp, Abishai starts licking his chops. They walk right in uh, almost under a, a magical force field of cover from the Lord. And there is Saul, the very one who is leading the Ziphites to try to kill his master David. And so Abishai has a weak moment. Abishai is like, oh no, oh no, this is meant to be. This is too good. He's sleeping right there and here's the spear. It's just meant to be. We should kill Saul. Now, Abishai, that's not the right thing to do. It's not the right thing to do. Abishai was a courageous man. He was on the right side. He's with David, but he's taking this too far. It's not time to kill Saul. Abishai has stumbled into a point of weakness. In fact, now it's good that Abishai is not alone because he would have killed Saul when he shouldn't have, but David is there to protect him. He's a good brother. He's a good fellow elder. In fact, you remember in our series in Titus, one of the signs that a godly man is qualified to be a leader and elder is not just that he knows what to do when it's right, but he knows to rebuke others, even fellow elders, when they go astray. And so David sticks up for the truth, even against one of his best friends, even against a courageous, godly man who's backslidden or is caught in a, a weak moment of temptation. Look at verse 9. But David said to Abishai, Do not, no, do not destroy him, 
Who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? So he says, it's not time to kill Saul. We're not going to take our enemy's life into our own hands. So again, that theme of preciousness of life in the sight uh, of God. David sees Saul, even his very own enemy, his life is precious. He might want Saul to die. It might be right that Saul would die, but it is not David's job to kill him right now, to return evil for evil. David says to Abishai, no. For now, his life is going to be precious in our eyes. Now, we know that this is not this is not normal David in the sense that David has previously had a chance to kill Saul and cut off his garment. So Saul's been weak like Abishai before. In fact, in chapter 25, David is angry at Nabal. Nabal's been mean to him. He's called him mean names. He's not loved him. He's been, he's been evil to him. And David is ready to kill Nabal. But God has sanctified David in, in, recent, in recent days. In chapter 25 and chapter 24, we see that David has learned from his mistakes. He learned because God struck down Nabal himself that if God wants to kill Saul, God can do it. David does not have to return the gossip for the gossip. David does not have to return the Facebook slander for the Facebook slander. David does not have to return hatred for hatred. If God wants to take Saul out of his life, if God wants to exact vengeance on Saul, he can do it. How does he know? Because he did it to Nabal in just the last chapter. You see his renewed, his renewed faith? Look at verse 10. David said, As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him down, or his day will come to die, or he will go down to battle and to perish. God can defend me against Nabal. God has a perfect track record. Then God can defend me against whoever, the Sauls in our life, the people who are pursuing us as enemies. But he, he trusts that right now this life will be precious in his eyes and he does not kill him. So that's Abishai. Let's, let's look at Abner, the next person who's focused in on verses 13 through 16. So David grabs the spear and the jug instead of killing him, takes it away, takes away the weapon for war and stands back to a safe distance. And he awakens the leader, the main protector of Saul. His name was Abner. It was his job to guard the precious life of the Lord's anointed this time, Saul. And so David calls to Abner and, and David makes a teaching moment out of this. He says, Abner, what are you doing? While you were sleeping, while you were being lazy, while you were failing at your job, I came into the camp and anyone, and I included, could have killed Saul, the one whose life was supposed to be precious in your eyes, and you did not protect him. This is a rebuke to Abner. This is a rebuke to us that we should guard other people's lives. But also this, and we ought to, and if we don't, then, uh, then, then that's bad on our part. But also, notice, it, it, there's also this kind of backhanded irony here. You couldn't protect his life. It was your job to protect Saul's life, and you couldn't. Because God is making a point here. God is making an object lesson out of this, Abner, that you're with the wrong guy, and that if God wants to destroy him, I just want to show you he could, but he didn't. Abner was not a faithful friend. Abner did not take uh, not only David, but Saul's life as ultimately precious in uh, in his eyes. And so just a little side note that came up here. It's really ironic that Abner's supposed to be Saul's greatest protector, and he doesn't do it. And so, friend listening out there, your ungodly friends who, who propose to be your greatest supporters and to tell you that you're, you're good and everything's great and we're here for you, they might not actually be your greatest protectors and greatest lovers of your soul. They might actually be doing a very f poor job of it. But notice David. David and Saul don't have the greatest relationship. In fact, Saul doesn't like David because David tells him that he's wrong. David tells him that he's in sin. I want you to see that it could be the people who you call your friends are not really your friends. And the ones whom you're hating right now, who you are giving the stiff arm in your life, who you're resisting their counsel, their interrogation, their love, the Davids in your life, they could be the ones who, who love you the most. You see... The life of Saul was not really precious in Abner's eyes, but the life of Saul was precious in David's eyes. Precious in his eyes. He spared Abner, he spared Saul. Uh, and then the next the next section, let's focus on, on David and Saul here. It's hard to tell who's the, the main character emphasis here. Um, 
But what's going on in verses 17 through 20 is that David now confronts and reasons and pleads with Saul. He says, Saul, you're still pursuing me. You said you were repentant. You said you weren't going to try to kill me. But look, the Ziphites have rallied you up and Abner's rallied you up and you're coming to kill me. You're coming to kill me again. What have I done that is wrong? Saul, I could have killed you, but I didn't. So what do we learn about David here? Well, not only was his enemy's life precious in his sight, but so precious that he doesn't just run away from him, but he, he goes to him and says, I want to win you. I want you to see that what you're doing is wrong. He reasons with him. This is pure, passionate, patient reasoning. Look at verse 18. He said, why does my Lord pursue after me, his servant? What have I done? What evil is on my hands? And so, friends, when we have enemies, we those who wrongfully gossip about us or slander us or persecute us, we should not return that evil for evil. We ought to kindly and patiently reason with them. What exactly is it that I've done wrong? Don't you see, I want, I want to know if I've done wrong. In fact, David is so bold as to say, if, if I've sinned against the Lord, then may he receive my sacrifice. I'm willing to believe maybe I did do wrong, but show me where it is. If I need to get right with the Lord, I'll get right with the Lord. If I need to get right with you, I'll get right with you. Do you see the humility that David exhibits here to those who are wrongfully persecuting him? Do you see he's willing to believe he's wrong? But do you all see that he's willing to risk his life to plead with his enemies? He does not want Saul to die before it's too late. He does not want Saul to go to hell. This is, this is the power of persuasion through his patience and through his love, through showing that Saul is precious in his eyes. And this, this gets to Saul. I wish it would have got to Saul for good, but only temporarily. But it does get to Saul here. Saul is, can't believe it. Saul is amazed that anyone would love him this way, that would not give him what he deserves. And so I want you to see how the Lord uses this uh, to get glory in, in Saul's life and David's life among all the Ziphites, among Abner, among, among uh, Abishai as they watch. So I think the main character in verses 21 through 25 is is the Lord. I, I see that because the most word occurrences here happen about the Lord because the summary statement is about the Lord, the Lord blessing David and, and the, the, the work of, of the Lord. So verse 23, David says this, The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness, and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And as your life was precious in my eyes, may my life be precious in the Lord's eyes and deliver me. So we see that all this has been going on because the Lord is doing something good. The Lord allowed the Ziphites to rally up Saul and pursue him. The Lord will allow wickedness in your life, enemies to pursue you, perhaps to get greater glory and to show his greater love. The Lord allows Abishai to have a chance to kill Saul. And David steps in and says, no, that's not what the Lord would want. He teaches him about the Lord. He allows Abner to be asleep and to fall into this uh, slumber so that David could arouse him and say, see, look, you couldn't protect him. You deserve to die. You cannot protect. When the Lord has decided to destroy, you're just a man. You're just a sinful person. And then he shows Saul, Saul, I could have killed you, but I didn't. I'm giving you a chance to repent. It's the kindness of the Lord that ought to lead us to repentance. And Saul is just broken by this. I have been mean and mean and slandered and gossiped and pursued him, and he did not return the same. And he's broken by this. Who, who can love like this? Why have you done this? And it gives David a platform to say, because the Lord is gracious because the Lord is just, because the Lord is righteous and faithful. And so it's, it's used a way to try to win Saul, to try to win people, to glorify God. So ultimately the story is not just about David. Uh, it's about us. It's about us and our sin and pursuing and rejecting Christ, rejecting his commandments all our life. Uh, rejecting his glory and nature and not honoring him as we should, rejecting him even after he saves us, resisting the Holy Spirit, and yet his patience and waiting for us, drawing us to repentance, not giving us what we deserve so that ultimately the true son of David would come. And when they were trying to 
persecute him and he could have called down legions of angels to destroy him. He said, no, it is the Father's good will that I lay down my life to ransom many. He's trying to win Judas. He was going to win Peter. He was going to win Paul. Though Paul, formerly Saul, was persecuting Stephen, it was this that would persuade him to believe. So as we end, I want you to think about this. If you are alive, breathing and listening to this, it is because your life is still precious in the eyes of the Lord. He has not given you what you deserve, though you have rejected Him. But He is offering peace and mercy if you'll take off your crown and put down your spear and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. You would receive His love, turn from your sins. It does not mean that everybody will do that, and that does not mean that everybody will be saved, because the Lord is going to judge Saul for his unrepentance. The Lord judged Nabal for his unrepentance. But as long as you're still alive, Nabal and Saul, Christian, tangled in sin, stop rejecting the Lord and go to Him who has shown His love for you first by laying down His life for you, by showing that uh, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of His saints. Precious are his enemies that he would be willing to die for many of them. So I hope you see the love not of David only, but of the great son of David who um, is foreshadowed and comes in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I love you all. Hope you've gotten some good things out of this. Remind you of Potluck Sunday. And uh, especially if you have any questions, please, I'd love some good questions. Text them, email, post them on Facebook about biblical elders of the life of Bethany Baptist Church to help us have a healthy and a productive conversation as we hope to move forward in the life of our church. Good night.